This week on Waterways. Bonefish and Tarpon Unlimited. And the Bun Cannon Project. Scales as big as a silver dollar. They grow to six or seven feet in length. They fight hard enough to leave even the most experienced anglers scraped and sore. The tarpon. Since the 1890s, the tarpon has drawn fishermen to the Gulf Coast of North America. In some places, whole towns sprouted up just to serve sportsmen who wanted to catch a fish they called the Silver King. Today, the tarpon is one of the main attractions in a sport fishing industry that brings more than one and a half billion dollars to the state of Florida. In fact, sport fishing is second only to the citrus industry in its importance to the Florida economy. Uh, about 50 to 60 percent of the world records for tarpon are from Florida waters, so it's a strong magnet for folks. Folks are coming literally from every corner of the world to fish uh, the Keys because of its well-known uh, crossroads uh, for these animals. So it's, it's a global community that focuses on the quality of the resource angling of the Keys, which stands some of the highest probabilities of catching large tarpon and bonefish anywhere in the world. Tarpon fishermen know they're sitting on a good thing in the Florida Keys, and they want to keep it that way. While large numbers of tarpon still show up in Florida each spring, there are troubling signs from Florida and the rest of the Gulf. Port Aransas, Texas used to call itself the tarpon capital of the world. In the 1950s, the tarpon left. With the exception of a few fish here and there, they have not returned. Closer to home, places like Sandy Key Basin in Florida Bay, a hot tarpon spot in the 1970s, have gone cold in the years since. The, the interest arose really from the strong angling interest and the question about why one year is more productive for fishing than others. I mean, why do we see this great catches this year and no fish the next? But also uh, a broader scale concern that folks that have been around quite a while were clearly pointing out when you looked around, say, the U.S. regionally, that from places that had been historically significant and productive fisheries, some of these had completely disappeared. Fishermen and women don't know whether to be alarmed or not. Are tarpon on the decline? Or have they just moved to new places? Rather than wait to find out, world record holders like Billy Pate decided to take action. Well, Tom Davidson, our chairman, lives up at Ocean Reef, and he's quite a conservationist, a very good businessman. And uh, he was uh, Bill Curtis, who's one of the oldest guides around from Miami, you know, Bill and he was bone fishing with uh, Bill and they got to talking about the subjects of, that we're talking about here, all the things that are making our fish fishing not as good as it used to be. And so they just decided, let's form an organization to do something about it. The grassroots effort soon spawned a new nonprofit organization, Bonefish and Tarpet Unlimited, or BTU. The group would unite anglers with fish scientists like Jerry Alt. So the thought was that what we really needed to do was to reach out, and to reach out to scientists, to fishermen, to anglers, to writers, the whole picture, and find a mechanism to bring that knowledge together in a centralizing force, and, and BTU arose from there, and so BTU now is essentially a, a clearinghouse for research, uh, outreach, and understanding of the resources that has a global outreach. BTU immediately attracted some of the biggest names in sport fishing, from Billy Pate, holder of more than 25 world fly fishing records, to Stu Apt, considered by many to be the godfather of flats fishing. Charter members also included Chico Fernandez and Sandy Moret, renowned anglers and fly fishing instructors who have visited many of the world's best fishing flats. Bill Curtis, inventor of the flats fishing platform, Joan and Lee Wolf, International Game Fish Hall of Fame legends, and Mark Sosen, host of America's favorite fishing shows. When these famous anglers started comparing their notes, they began to suspect that the tarpon they pursue during the spring and summer spend the rest of the year in another part of the world, perhaps in Mexico or Central America. This thought alarmed Billy Pate. 
He had been to Central America and had seen what can happen to tarpon there. Oh, I guess the first time that I really saw it bad was in the country. Uh, I asked somebody uh, where I could find out the best place to fish, and they sent me to a guy. And uh, I said, well, where do you fish for these big ones? He says, right in the bay out here where you're looking. And I said, well, what do you, what do you catch them with? He says, I harpoon them. Anglers have known for a long time that many tarpon migrate. Large numbers of the fish show up in shallows along the west coast of Florida in March or April. They start to clear out in July. It was anyone's guess where the fish go when they aren't near the coast. The only way to find out is to travel with the tarpon. Modern technology has made it possible not only to travel with the tarpon, but to see what the world is like around them. In the last uh, five years or so, a technology really is coming out of aerospace and military technology that we can utilize uh, uplinks from satellites, uh, uplinks to satellites from, from uh, tags, tags themselves that can archive information because they're small computers that collect information on water temperature, uh, position of the animal, depth, and we have a chronological clock can give us real-time information about use of the environment by animals, one which is extremely important to understand preferences and changes, but it also then provides information on real-time migrations. Where are animals going? What are the conditions they're favoring during those migrations? How long do they spend in these locations? And what are the motivating factors that cause them to move? So we really invoked, if you will, higher-end technology to help us move along that way, and it's been important for increasing understanding. One of the things Jerry Alt and BTU have learned from the tags is that fish do indeed migrate between Mexico and the United States. Why not? But we tagged fishes in Mexico uh, this last year and have found that in fact fishes are moving rather rapidly between locations in Mexico up into U.S. waters. We had one that moved 660 miles in a period of 28 days just motoring between uh, the U.S. and foreign waters and more or less confirming our thoughts that there was this out-migration, but now we've absolutely connected the, uh, the, the distribution of tarpon between the U.S. and other national uh, countries. Using the temperature and depth data collected on the tags, scientists began to learn about the cues that caused tarpon to migrate. The path that one fish took south from the Carolinas was especially enlightening. The walk down the coast was remarkable because we found out that there's definitely a preferred thermal environment that the animals are migrating in. And so, if you will, the fish are smart enough to stay in that temperature and we find that they move down the coast in the temperature, but they actually go through periods of migration where we'll have movement and then basically a period of, of, of stasis stopping. But the, um, uh, the um, stimulus for re-migrating uh, re or continue the migration was actually cold front passage. We found when the fronts were coming through, the animals actually went deeper. And then as the front passed, they came up and began this burst migration. And they'd, they'd move down X miles of coast and go back in the stasis period. And then another front would pass and they'd do this burst migration. Dr. Alt suspects the fish are working to stay in water that is 77 or 78 degrees Fahrenheit. In the fall, they must move farther and farther south to find waters that warm. Perhaps all the way to Mexico and beyond. Dr. Ald is also discovering new things about the behavior of tarpon. We found that there was a day-night periodicity to position of tarpon, which we had no sense about, and that is that during the nighttime, it turns out the tarpon are actually deep, the deepest that they get during any period of the day. They come up to where they reach nearly surface water about 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and it's very rhythmical, up and down uh, throughout the days, except when full moons come in and we found that during full moon period we get animals bouncing up and down between the surface and depth 24 hours a day. So they actually go into a full-scale uh, feeding regime and it makes sense when you think about the morphology of tarpon looking up. If he's got moonlight to, to, to basically highlight his bait source, his food source, he's in a full feeding, feeding mode. By the end of 2003, BTU had tagged 21 fish with the archival transmitting tags. While these tags provided great information, people could only read the information if and when the tag popped up and was found, something that happens only about 50% of the time. To make sure every tag counts, BTU will soon be using even more sophisticated tags, called satellite archival transmitting tags. That will allow them to collect real-time information, 
even if the tags are never physically retrieved. $3,500 per tag, the satellite pop-up archival transmitting tags. That sounds like a lot of money, but again, you have to put it in the context of the value of the resource, and, and it's a drop in the bucket in the big picture. Using these tags, BTU hopes to solve more questions about tarpon, including one that has long puzzled scientists. Where do they spawn? Anglers have seen tarpon that seem ready to mate gather in large circles called daisy chains. Researchers have pulled recently hatched larval tarpon out of channels that lead to shallow places like Florida Bay and Indian River Lagoon. Where the tarpon go to lay the eggs that will become larvae is still a mystery. The effort to study and protect tarpon has benefited from a close relationship between scientists and experienced anglers. The reality is that you're trying to take the collective wisdom of those folks that are actively involved in the resource, have seen the day in, the day out, the variability, etc., and try to impart the right question to them so you can get a response about what are the key factors, but then to use the science to help design a process of investigation that can delve deeper into the question. So we utilize those folks because, one, they have this incredible and beautiful knowledge about the resource. They understand those, the, the variations, the intricacies, and so by teaming up, if you will, uh, we're able to basically, uh, through a, a process of intellectual osmosis, gain that knowledge directly that we can't find in books. It's not available any other way. And the other thing is to get the reliable use of these individuals on the water. And we've, we've, we've really strategically organi or organized our scientific efforts to, to use those folks in our active research programs. They're, you know, they're, they're, they're driving the boats. They're out there with us, helping us design and direct uh, studies. And I don't think we could have gotten nearly as far along in the process without that expert advice that we're, we're gaining through them. So it's a team up, it's a collaboration, and it's a beautiful one that needs to be maintained. The collaboration needs to be maintained if we are to protect not only the magnificent tarpon, but the economy which depends upon it. When the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary was formed, the goal was to protect and preserve the valuable ecological and cultural resources contained within. Each year, the list of challenges grows, from problems with illegal dumping, to diagnosing new coral diseases, to mitigating and assessing vessel groundings. There's no end in sight. Thankfully, the sanctuary staff receives support in many of these efforts from dedicated volunteers. One of these motivated citizens is a man named Dennis Trellowicz. Every month for years, Dennis and his group, the Submerged Resource Inventory Team, have documented the locations of over 300 shipwrecks in Keys waters. Well, the Submerged Inventory uh, Team was formed really by Chuck Hayes, my friend who left the area last year. He was uh, working with the sanctuary for a long, long time. And I guess it was in the early 93, when I first came down here, the people in Washington were intrigued the fact we'd go out and look for wrecks and we'd find things and I'd take pictures. And they'd ask that if we would make it a much more uh, formal kind of affair. And that's what we did. The Submerged Resource in Inventory Team, which now Dennis Trellowitz is the head of, uh, and by default with Chuck Hayes moving out of the, the uh, area, has been instrumental in elevating the visibility of cultural resources in the sanctuary. They, Dennis has been tenacious, but by keeping us, keeping cultural resources on everybody's radar screen in the sanctuary, uh, they've documented five to six hundred sites, not all of them cultural, but some of them biologically important as well. And it's, they're like having other staff members out there. One of the shipwreck sites that Hayes and Trellowicz documented is found one mile west of Cary's Fort Reef off Key Largo in 14 feet of water. Two recreational lobster divers, Miami Herald employees, were the first to bring the cluster of cannons there to the attention of the sanctuary. They told sanctuary officer Benny Davis, who passed the information along to Hayes and Trellowicz. At first, the volunteers shrugged off the tip but at the urging of former sanctuary manager Alan Bunn, the three finally set out to investigate the coordinates. What they found launched an odyssey. 
And it was in October in uh, 93. Alan came with us and we decided we'd plunk in the water and drift along and voila, we found them. It was rather interesting. Uh, Chuck and Alan were on one side of the boat and they, I heard them say, hey, there are two cannons. I quickly scampered up, got my gear on, got my camera, went over the side, landed on the pile of 10. At the site, the team found 13 cannons encrusted with over two inches of solid calcium carbonate. They also found an anchor in parts of a ship's mast, but no signs of the ship itself. They designated the site Bunn Cannon Patch after their associate, Alan Bunn. Was the ship's grounding, 13 cannons, visible. There may be more that's buried we can't see. There's a ship's anchor, there's evidence of hard, uh, mast hardware that the ship was to mast it, which was standard practice in the Royal Navy. If you hit the reef to get off, you lighten the ship, threw everything off that you could get a hold of, and hoped that you could refloat it. Trello estimated that jettisoning the cannons and anchor represented a lightening of the ship of approximately 11,600 pounds. The question is, what ship? Trellowick's retirement was about to end, and a new career as a detective began. Because he could not get accurate measurements without raising and cleaning the cannons, he requested that one of the cannons be recovered and restored. To make this happen, Trellowick navigated the winding red tape road and eventually funded the restoration out of his own pocket. It um, was 10 years before NOAA and the state determined that it was going to be in the public interest and of benefit to recover the cannon. And it's a, a long story, but a series of documentation efforts, a series of deliberations on, on is this in the public interest, how archaeologically significant is the site, what's the value of the cannons on the bottom as they sit for people to come and see as they were originally jettisoned on the bottom. With permission granted, money raised and a team assembled, the next step was to figure out how to lift an 800-pound cannon off the ocean floor. Fortunately, the team had some connections. But we got the National Undersea Research Center involved, uh, the UNCW Wilmington, who, who run the Aquarius program and are also our, our kind of our science arm of the sanctuary, support a lot of science in the sanctuary and have uh, great underwater capabilities. So again, partnered with them to go out on, on their boat, the Sabina, and we were essentially gonna do a dry run on, on day one. After more than 10 years, Dennis Trellowicz was about to enter the next phase in his search for the truth. I went out early to mark the site, threw the buoy out there, then Dave came with uh, a couple of people, and then uh, NERC people came with their boat, and uh, I put the buoy on it so we didn't have to go looking for it. So they uh, asked me to move my boat aside so they could go down and look. So I went in with uh, two of my friends watching what was going on, and they were going to just lift it up, you know, see whether or not they could do that. And I guess they suddenly realized that, hey, this thing is going to come up easy. Let's bring it up and not fool with it. Well, when they were doing that, I went back to my boat to get my camera. I want to take pictures of it. And I scamper on the boat, and my colleague, J.J. Kennedy, was there. He said, what are you coming back to the boat for? I said, well, get my camera and take pictures of him raising it. And he points, he said, they got on board the boat already. It was just a matter of a couple of minutes. They were able to pick that up, move it, and get it on board, which I thought was quite remarkable. And it was a fairly simple process. Was straps, about initially added a 500-pound lift bag. Uh, that wasn't budging it. Added another 200-pound lift bag, so we had 700 pounds of lift. It started to get tender on the bottom. Added an, a third 200-pound uh, lift bag, got that about halfway full. It came up gently off the bottom. There was a line attached back to the boat, swam it over, hooked it up, and, and uh, gradually raised it out of the water. The recovery was a success. For the Cannon Restoration, Trellowicz turned to the experts at Motivation Inc., a group that is closely associated with Mel Fisher Enterprises. Well, here at the Mel Fisher Enterprises, um, we, we recover historic shipwreck artifacts um, and preserve them for the benefit of the public and for the um, benefit of the artifacts as well. Um, you know, we, we recover them and uh, do the conservation work like we're doing on this cannon and 
all the artifacts we recover are preserved and entered into our database that's uh, now been made available to the general public on our website, millfisher.com. Um, in the research database, it shows every artifact that we've recovered from all our shipwrecks that we're working um, and shipwrecks that other people are working, such as um, this site uh, where the cannon came from, where we're offering our conservation services to other people or organizations um, and conserving those artifacts as well. With electric currents running through the cannon, Chief Technician Abraham Lopez hoped to have the crust removed after a few months of treatment. Lopez estimates up to 200 pounds of carbonate will be removed from this cannon. Well, this is a typical English cannon. By the design, the patterns of uh, construction and casting, uh, this is an English cannon. This uh, was, uh, cannon was made before, after uh, 1750. By the uh, design of the, uh, the blue, but there are the gas cabal and numbers on it, the same on the trilliums. Uh, we're still working on it. We're still working on the historical research. Based on early observations, researchers speculated that the grounding took place while Florida was held by the British between 1763 and 1783. Until the inscription on the cannons could be better read, the team would have to wait to fill the gap in the maritime record of shipwrecks in the Upper Keys. The sanctuary program is mandated to protect all of the natural resources, but also the cultural resources. And so many times you think of the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary as being coral, fish, marine zones, uh, seagrass, but embedded within all those resources are a huge amount of cultural resources. And it's always kind of taken a back seat because we have so many issues with natural resources in the Keys that it takes a lot of our focus to do that. There is little question for most Keys residents about the importance of the marine ecosystems in the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary. Less appreciated are the cultural treasures that are laid to rest on the ocean floor. Thanks to the infectious enthusiasm of people like Dennis Trellowicz, the stories behind these relics won't remain lost to us beneath the waves. It's interesting to dive. I find it very interesting. I like to see life, etc. And hoping that one day you'll be able to find, you know, a ship's bell. I can say, hey, I know what this is, etc. But um, my older brother thinks I'm sort of a nut. You know, why, why would you want to do that? But um, I think it's fun. It really is. You got to do something when you're retired. Can't sit and watch TV all day. It is actually possible to sit and watch TV all day. But fortunately for the annals of history, Trellowicz was compelled to solve the mystery of the Bun Cannon Patch. Keep an eye and ear out for the answer to this mystery, coming to a permanent exhibit near you.